<coughs> we continue now with uh, Dr. Uh, Roy Vilozhny, uh, uh, who specializes in Imami Shi religious thought and intellectual history, and is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Arabic Language and Literature at the University of Haifa. Uh, Roy's research is based primarily on the close reading and analysis of literature produced by Imami Shi'i scholars uh, from medieval times until the pre-modern uh, era. A recurring theme in his research is the role of Shi'i, uh, of the Shi'i canon of Hadith uh, that this uh, canon played in the consolidation of doctrines and theological notions, both at the time of its formation during the 9th and 10th centuries and in subsequent generations. Uh, he has published a monograph on um, El Barqi, um, and his current project, again uh, funded by the uh, ISF, uh, Israel Science Foundation, is dedicated to the examination of the phenom phenomenon of Hadith Qudsi uh, in Shi'i literary tradition, very interesting topic. Um, the emergence and development of Shi'i studies in Western academia starting from the early 20th century is another facet of uh, Vilozhny's uh, current uh, work. Uh, please, Oi, Tfadlan. Thank you, Michael, for the very kind introduction. I join the other speakers in thanking the organizers, Professor Friedman, Professor Landau Tasseron, for the invitation. I would also like to thank the uh, staff of the Academy for the very warm hospitality. And as I told you, Yohanan, in the lunch break, during the lunch break, I apologize for taking the liberty uh, to discuss a subject which, is, which falls beyond the realm of Jailia or Islam. Um, the title of uh, my lecture, you may have noticed, comprises two elements. One is rather universal and refers to the term myth and to the notion of pre-existence, and the other to which the bulk of this talk will be devoted is most, more specific and concerns the manners in which this myth, a central theme in the literatures of various manifestations of Shi'ism, was developed, utilized, interpreted, and elaborated upon by Imami Shi'i scholars. Before I get to the subject itself, three preliminary methodological remarks may be useful. First, my choice to use the term myth uh, to describe some recurrent themes in uh, Shi'i literature, including pre-existence, is derived from both the conviction that Shi'i sources are replete with uh, mythic materials, as well as from the hope that the application um, of uh, this term in the field of Shi'i studies will help us to evaluate Shi'ism from fresh new angles. Uh, second, I'm aware of the complexity of the term myth and propose that for the sake of today's lecture, we will adhere to a rather simple definition, namely that a myth is a sacred story a community tells itself in order to explain how the world and man have reached their present state. And finally, a word on pre-existence. By this term, I'm referring to the idea that prior to the creation of the physical world and of the first man, a series of events of far-reaching consequences uh, had taken place. Resorting to a mythic pre-existential era in order to provide an explanation for the human experience in this world is familiar since antiquity. Uh, alongside various ancient Near Eastern civilizations such, such as the Mesopotamian, the Akkadian, the Hebrew, and the Zoroastrian, in whose sources we find allusions to pre-existential events, one cannot not mention the Greeks and above all Plato. Despite numerous deviations and intellectual developments since, since Plato's time, the fourth century BCE, he is still considered responsible for laying the, ide the ideological foundations of both Occidental and Oriental thought. Of most relevance for our discussion today is Plato's notion of a pre-existent realm of souls, first mentioned in Mino and then further developed in Phaedo. Um, he sees this uh, realm of the souls as the source of human knowledge, especially that of abstract principles and ideas, which this knowledge is then acquired in this world through recollection, anamnesis, of that pre-existential realm. This idea was later adopted and adapted by Christian theologians and Gnostics and circulated extensively in the early Christian world, 
at least until the middle of the 6th century CE, when Emperor Justinian decided to include it in his list of 10 anathemas against origin. The church father to whom the initial introduction of the idea into Christian thought is attributed. This is not the place to trace in detail the different channels through which Plato's, Plato's ideas reached Islamic thought, but I would like nevertheless to briefly mention the enormous influence on medieval Muslim thinkers of another Greek philosopher. I mean, of course, Plotinus. Active in the third century CE and known as the father, uh, as the founder of Neoplatonism, Plotinus modified in his Enneads, edited and published by his disciple Prophyry of Tyre, the Platonic notion of pre-existence in general and of the soul's pre-existence pre in particular, and he developed it into a triangular, full-blown cosmology of the one, the intellect, and the soul. As is by now well known, an Arabic paraphrased version of, the th of three of these anads, the fourth on the soul, the fifth on the intelligible world, and the sixth on the one, that discuss metaphysics became exceptionally popular among medieval Muslim intellectuals, in intellectuals under the erroneous title, The Theology of Aristotle. Echoes of, this cosmolo of the cosmology of Plotinus, including its Platonic uh, foundations, are thus to be found in the works of numerous medieval Islamic thinkers of a wide range of intellectual traditions, mostly philosophers and mystics, but as we will soon observe, and as was noted, noted by Ignaz Goltz here as early as 1909, also in the, in the most ancient layer of Imami Shi'i literature, the hadith ascribed to the prophet and the imams. Among the multiple expressions of the, of the notion of pre-existence in Shi'i thought, I would like to concentrate today on the idea that the souls were created long before the bodies, and that the soul's experience in the realm that preceded the creation of the world and of men had been decisive for the human condition in the created world. Furthermore, since according to Islam, conduct in this world determines one's, one's fate in the afterlife, and since conduct in this world depends to a great extent on pre-existential factors, it was inevitable that the latter would also be seen as, a crucial, uh, as crucial with respect to the world to come. In the first part of my talk, I will, ref I will refer to the Quranic nucleus around which the notion of the soul's pre-existence developed, and then I will move on to describe the further elaboration of this idea in the literature of Hadith. In the second part, I will show the profound change of attitude in the Buwahid period, that is from 945 until 1055 CE, towards the raw materials uh, that deal with the idea of pre-existence, that is the Quran and the Hadith. And lastly, I will try to give you a glimpse of the approach of two or three scholars of the Safavid era, uh, 1501 to 1722 CE, to the very same materials. So, Quran and Hadith. When one reads through early Imam Shi'i sources, and by early I mean the extant compilations of Hadith, the oldest of, the oldest of which go back to the 9th century CE, the impression gained is that pre-existence is a prominent theme therein. As any prominent theme in the sayings attributed to the Imams and to the Prophet, pre-existence too is depicted as something to which God refers, even if only elusively in the Quran. The Imams, in turn, who according to the Shi'i belief are endowed with the capability and required knowledge to shed light on God's word and to disperse the ambiguity that surrounds it, further elaborate on the subject. That being said, the gap between the meager in, uh, Quranic references to the notion of pre-existence in general and of pre-existential human agency in the form of souls in particular and between the rich information provided by the Imams in this regard is nevertheless stri striking. Professor Uri Rubin, who sadly passed away recently, examined in 2015 this gap in the context of the Prophet Muhammad. Rubin showed that in contrast to post-Quranic sources that are rich in depictions of Muhammad's pre-existence, the Quran itself includes only one verse, 26 Ashura 219, that could, not without some creativity, be understood as alluding to this notion due to the expression which Abdel Halim translates uh, not at all uh, in a mythic uh, fashion your movements among the uh, worshippers. 
In addition, Rubin rightly argues the notion of pre-existence emerges in the Quran in three main contexts. First, the Quran itself, whose source is said to be Ummul Kitab, Quran 13, 39, Kitab Maknun, Quran 56, 78, or Allah al Mahfuz, Quran 85, 21, 22. Second, Al Kaaba, which is referred to as Awal Bayt in Quran 3, 96. And finally, of most relevance to our discussion, a primordial con a contract that God made with prophets as well as with mankind at large, mentioned in Quran 381, uh, Quran 7, 172, and Quran 33, 7. And luckily, uh, the chair of our session is an expert uh, on this uh, third uh, um, um, aspect of pre-existence in the Quran, the covenant. As mentioned earlier, I would like uh, to focus today on the idea that the creation of the souls, al-arwah, took place long before the creation of the bodies. The most relevant Quranic verse around which this narrative in the Shi'i tradition evolves is Quran 7, 172, known as the covenant verse, Ayatul Mithaq, although the word covenant, Mithaq, is not mentioned in it. I will read you uh, Abdul Halim's translation of this verse. When your Lord took out the offspring from the loins of the children of Adam and made them bear witness about themselves, he said, am I not your Lord? And they replied, yes, we bear witness. So you cannot say on the day of resurrection, we were not aware of this, end quote. Uh, end of the quote. As you can see, there is no explicit or implicit mention of souls or of pre-existence in the sense to which I referred in the introduction. That is, a time prior to the creation of the world and of the, of the first man. The verse clearly describes a dramatic event whose consequences stretch from the time of its occurrence until the day of the resurrection. Yet the setting seems to be posterior to the creation of the world, of Adam and probably also to the creation of Adam's children from whose loins their offspring is uh, taken. An examination of a Tabari's commentary on this verse, and as you uh, all know, his commentary gives us a fair overview of the exe exegetical opinions prevalent within the Islamic Sunni community until the late 9th, early 10th century CE, corroborates these impressions. First, there is consensus among commentators that the event took place after the creation of Adam. Second, several accounts specify that it took place following Adam's descent to earth, either in Naaman, a wadi in the vicinity of Mount Arafah near Mecca, or at the Dajni area in India. Third, as to the entities with whom the covenant had been done, most versions refer not without connection to the word dhuriya mentioned in the Quranic verse, to dhar, that is particles, seeds, something as small as ants, and at any rate, something more tangible than spirit or soul. According to only one account, the pact was convened between God and the souls prior to the creation of the bodies. There is also an agreement that God took from Adam's loins the dhar, or seeds, of every person, nasama, that was to be created until the day of resurrection. The destiny of all future human beings was determined on this occasion, including who, despite this covenant, will end up in hell, who will enter paradise, and the lifespan of every indi individual. Some commentators also allude to the concept of fitra, mentioned in, mentioned in Quran 3030, as the natural disposition God inst instilled in mankind as resulting from the fact that the seeds, or dhar, of all human beings were present on this occasion and therefore none is born without its traces. In conclusion, not of the whole lecture, <laughs> uh, yeah. on Tavari's commentary on this verse, although posterior to the, to the creation of Adam, the general idea that emerges from a Tavari's commentary is nevertheless of a primordial event that was to determine humanity's future. This narrative, it could be justly argued, is a variation on the classical myth of pre-existence, transferring the setting of the event into the created world and stressing the universal gene genealogical aspect. Namely, all human beings are of Adam's progeny. All human beings bear in them the potential to be God-fearing. 
when one looks at the earlier uh, layer of Shi'i literature that revolves around the covenant verse, that is the traditions ascribed to the imams, either in thematic hadith compilations or in Quran commentaries by scholars um, active more or less in a Tabari's time, the 9th, 10th centuries CE, the feeling is of entering a slightly different territory. In what ways is, is it different? This is a big question, and I'm only in, at the beginning of an attempt to map this territory. But a preliminary examination brings to the fore several basic aspects. First, with regard to time, imami traditions clearly set the covenant event in a pre-existential era, that is, prior to the creation of the world and of the first man. The recurring, the recurring phrasing to describe this being, God created the souls of our Shia 2,000 years prior to the creation of their bodies. Second, this phrasing clearly associates the covenant with the souls of the future, belie future Shi'i believers rather than with a more tangible element such as the seeds taken from uh, Adam's loins. Uh, third, as you may also notice in this phrasing, the stress in uh, Shi'i traditions revolving around this event is on the Shi'i community rather than on humanity a as a whole. In consequence, many traditions specify that the covenant included, included not only acknowledgement of God, but also of Muhammad's uh, prophethood and of Ali's walaya, the three essential components of the Shi'i core belief. And the fourth thing um, is that uh, regarding the location of the event, the impression is that it is, it is seen as an extraterrestrial space uh, in a, sp a spiritual space rather than a ge geographical one. Moreover, several traditions refer to this space as another world, either as the world of the Dhar, Alam al Dhar, the world of the shadows, Al Adilla, or that of silhouettes of lights, Ashbah Nur. We are thus introduced to a whole new concept, a world of different nature in which the souls of future human beings are dwelling. These are only some basic observations. The picture is much more complex, but I would like to leave enough time to move from the myth itself to its implications. And by implications, at least in today's conference, I mean the difficulties and problematics that this myth raised within the Shi scholarly uh, discourse. In fact, traces of the difficulties raised by this myth are to be found already in the strata of the hadith itself. Several fundamental questions are integrated into the same traditions that promote this myth. For example, a disciple is said to have asked the sixth Imam, Jafar al-Sadiq, how could the Dhar answer God on his question, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And the Imam replied, I quote Jafar al-Sadiq, uh, God made in them, that is, in the dar, that which enabled them to answer when he asked them. This seems as a secondary question of the more general one. Of the more general one, what exactly the dar were on the occasion on the occasion of the covenant? On which Imam Sadiq replies, God made of them what was sufficient for him for this occasion. Another question that preoccupied, preoccupied the disciples of the Imams was whether the covenant event included the vision of God, Mu'ayana, or not. Uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq confirms that it included the vision of God, but uh, while the participants forgot the event itself, they maintained the acknowledgement, only the acknowledgement of God. These reservations or carries, however, seem to serve as a means to bolster, to bolster this narrative rather than to criticize it. They are presented as questions addressed at the Imam who resolve, resolves them one by one and by so doing, he gives the narrative its final shape. Moreover, these questions are rather naive and remain within the mythic realm. They do not, as we will see in later literature, question its very foundations. Following the period of the historical imams, that is, after the 12th imams, the, the 12th imams occultation in 940 CE, the Quran and the Hadith remained the, the source references of any doctrinal and ideological development. Even exceptionally critic scholars still felt committed to articulate their views in reference to these sources. In this context, one of the prevailing theses in the field of Shi'i studies 
to whose crystallization several scholars such as Madelung, Kohlberg, and Parasher uh, have contributed, and which has been repeatedly promoted and, em and emphasized by Professor Muhammad Ali Amir Moizi in the last three decades, is worthy of note. According to this thesis, the wide period, which happened to coincide with the onset of the 12th Imam's greater occultation, constituted a foundational turning point in Shi'i thought. In a nutshell, in many aspects of faith, one can observe from this period onwards a gradual transition from esoteric, mythic, and even magic conceptions to a more rationalistic, legalistic attitude. The marks of this transformation are also traceable in scholars' attitude uh, towards the uh, myth of, or the, the idea of pre-existence. Post-occultation scholars, who were no longer at ease with certain mythic, esoteric messages that the Quran and the Hadith convey, had to find a way to reconcile their commitment to these sacred sources with a more rationalistic approach. To demonstrate how this process affected the myth of pre-existence, I will refer to a famous dispute between a rather conservative teacher and his rationalist disciple during the Buaid period. I mean the one between Ibn Babawahi, known as Shaykh al-Saduq, died in 991 CE, and his pupil or disciple, Shaykh al-Mufid, who died in 1022. In a treatise whose purpose was to define the Imam Shi articles of faith, titled Etiqadat al-Imamiyah, al-Saduq devotes a chapter to the belief in spirits and souls and souls, al-i'tiqad fil nufus wal arwah. As Saduk's presentation of the imami belief regarding the souls is based primarily on Quranic verses and traditions by the Prophet and the Imams, from which he arrives at the following conclusion, whose resemblance, by the way, to the section on the soul in the aforementioned the, the theology of Aristotle is, not, is noteworthy. So, how he defines the souls? These are the, spir the spirits, al-nufus, al are the same as the souls, al-arwah. They are the source of life, bi al-hayat, and they are, pay attention, God's first creation, al-khalq al-awwal, to which he, God, granted speaking ability to confess his unity, and only later did he create the rest of creation. In addition, as saduq states that the souls were created for eternity, and not for a limited time, that they are alien on earth, anha fil ard gariba, imprisoned in the bodies. And this reminded me of the introduction to Kalila Wadimna also. That's, that's very Manichaean. Yeah. Okay. So we'll that's talk about we'll talk about yeah. uh, when when they depart from the bodies, they do not cease to exist. Rather, uh, some of them are tortured while others are in pleasant conditions until God brings them, brings them back into their bodies, that is, at the res resurrection. As you see, the basic myth of pre-existence, according to which the souls were created long before the bodies and are in fact independent, independent entities, is preserved. In a harsh critique of a saduk's formulation of many of the imami Shi articles of faith titled Tasheikh al-Aitiqad, a Shaykh al-Mufid, known as the precursor of the Imamiyah's ad adoption um, of rationalistic thought and kalam, literally demythologizes his teacher's perception of, of the souls. According to him, rather than in-depth investigation, a Shaykh al-Saduq resorted to conjecture. Had the Saduq only cited the relevant hadiths, says al-Mufid, and not attempted to offer his his own view as to their meaning, he would have not found himself uh, dealing with a subject matter that is far beyond his ca capability. According to al-Mufid, a saduk's view that the souls were created 2,000 years prior to the bodies and that the souls even knew each other in that era is first of all based on hadiths whose provenance is dubious, min ahadith al ahad. Second, this account, unlike what those who do not possess knowledge of the truths of things, haqqaq al-ashya think, is about the angels rather than the souls. It is not at all, al-Mufid stresses, what those who believe in metempsychosis or transmigration of the soul, tanasuch, think. The latter, he adds, have unfortunately influenced those Shi'is who, ad who adhere to the hadith too blindly, al-Hashwiyah, 
and who therefore believe that the souls as the active essences of the wat al-fa'ala on which it is commanded and forbidden were created in the world of the dar. In that world, according to their wrong belief, the souls were introduced to each other and had cognitive and communica communicative capacities. Only much later, Al-Mufid goes on to describe their uh, misconception, did God create bodies for the souls and installed them in them. Had that been, had, had that been the case, says Al-Mufid, we would have known what we went through, especially if we were reminded of it. Just as if someone who lived for some time in a city would never forget it. It would have been interesting, by the way, to hear Al-Mufid's opinion on three chapters of Basar al-Darajat by the pre buwahid traditionist, Safar al-Qummi, in which the Prophet, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the Imams share in great detail the, their memories of the pre-existential covenant. This text, however, perhaps due to the above-mentioned ideolo above ideological transformation of the buwahid era, never made it to Al-Mufid's library. Finally, Al-Mufid Al concludes, although a Shaykh al-Saduq was unaware of it, his statement regarding the belief in the souls is the view of the metempsychosists, Atanasukhiya, and this is a great sin, Jinaya Azima. Al-Mufid, so it seems, was not a great admirer of Plato, but he was not the only one who confused the soul's pre-existence with metempsychosis. In another treatise of his, Al-Masail al-Sarawiya, Al-Mufid offers his own explanation to the covenant verse. According to him, among the many different hadiths regarding this verse, the correct one has it that God took out the offspring of Adam from his loins as small part particles, dar, and filled with them the visible horizons. This was done for the purpose of showing Adam God's potence and providing him with knowledge regarding the future of his progeny. The idea is reminiscent of Genesis 22:17, where following the binding of Isaac, of Isaac, uh, God promises Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the, as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Um, Al-Mufid is not clear about the exact state of the dar and suggests to understand it as spiritless essences of the bodies of Adam's offspring. At any rate, it is clear that in his view, the dar had no active role whatsoever. If due to the literal sense of the covenant verse, someone still insists that the offspring of Adam were at this stage living, speaking entities, Al-Mufid offers the following argument. The, this verse is, not, is to be understood metaphorically, namely, that God makes a covenant with every mukallaf, that is, sane in mind who is obligated to observe the percepts uh, of religion of Adam's offspring in every generation. This covenant is achieved by providing each individual with reason, intelligence, akil in, Ar in Arabic, and sufficient evidence within the created world to reach the, base, the basic conclusion that he or she are created and that their creator is one and unique and merits worship. Similar ex explanations are to, f to be found in Quran commentaries by Al-Mufid's more or less contemporaries, such as Tusi and Tabrisi. One can observe that alongside a different kind of myth, that of uh, the divine spreading of Adam's offspring as dar all over the horizons, which Al-Mufid is willing to accept as valid interpretation of the covenant verse, he offers a pure rational or rationalistic way to understand the verse. If I was asked uh, which of the two reflects more genuinely Al-Mufid's thought, and I would not uh, give you the she response that he might have acted under uh, circumstances of uh, taqiyya, uh, I would opt for the uh, second, demythologizing de 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 explanation. But of course, the two ex uh, versions may well have existed peacefully in this great scholar's mind. The tension between the commitment of Shi uh, scholars to the transmitted word, that is the Quran and the Hadith on the one hand, and the desire to think and to write in accordance with the changing intellectual climate brings us to the final part of today's lecture. Some remarks on the Safavid era.
you may justifi justifiably ask why I'm jumping a few centuries forward to Safavid Iran. This, the short answer, and we could return to it later in the discussion, if you wish, is that in this period, most, mostly due to the need to Shiitize the state and to the gradual dominance of the Akbari school, the sources of hadith uh, return to the center of the stage. The early compilations of hadith are being copied, recopied, and distributed across, across the country. In addition, they become the focal point of thorough analysis, interpretation, classification, and rearrange rearrangement. In many aspects, the Akhbaris would like to see themselves as reviving the pre-rationalist era of Shia scholarship. Yet, at least six centuries elapsed, uh, elapsed since the time of Shaykh al-Saduq, perhaps the last major representative of the Kumi traditionist, traditionalist conservative school, until the 17th century. Scholars of the Safavid era have read Ibn Sina, Al-Ghazali, Surah Wardi, Ibn Arabi, and others. They cannot and wish not ignore centuries-long progress of Islamic sciences and thought. The reading, their reading of the Quran and the Hadith is thus inevitably reflective of their zeitgeist. The amount of works dedicated to the Quran and the Hadith in the Safavid era is overwhelming. And here too, I'm only in the initial stages of familiarizing myself uh, with it. Around the concept of pre-existence itself, one, one finds oneself uh, in front of an ocean of information. To give you just a, a taste of it, I will limit myself to two or three scholars whose views on the myth of pre-existence as it evolved in relation to the covenant verse are particularly revealing and indica indicative of the uh, intellectual climate. In the early 17th century, Muhammad Amin al-Astarabadi, known as the founder of the Akhbariya, wrote a commentary, Hashia, on Al-Kulaini's celebrated compilation uh, of Hadith al-Kafi. Unlike al-Mufid, al-Astarabadi embraces the idea of a primordial pre-existential covenant due to which humans are, are inherently bound to acknowledge their creator. He calls this the first taklif, or imposition of religious duties. A taklif al-awwal. From traditions that elaborate on this idea, he concludes that this first taklif occurred twice, once in an entirely abstract world and once in the world of the dhar. As for the world of the dhar, he explains, on that day, the souls were attached to a tiny body, jism sagir, as small as an ant. Clearly, one understands he believes that already at this stage there were souls that could be attached to tiny bodies. As for the entirely abstract world, the Imam's traditions, he says, refer to the abstract essence or quiddity, jawhar, that will in the future be attached to the bodies as shadows. Because people's minds at that time were unable to grasp an entirely abstract concept. He is then at ease with souls being attached to tiny bodies, but prefers um, to understand shadows metaphorically. A few decades later, in the middle of the same century, Muhammad Saleh al-Mazandarani, who equally struggles to understand what the Imams meant by dar and whether it represents a different pre-existential state than that of the shadows, suggests to understand shadows as referring to the same tiny bodies of the world of the dar that were mentioned in, uh, by al-Astarabadi. Al in comparison to the bodies of our world, these tiny bodies, al-Mazandarani says, could actually be seen as mere shadows. Towards the end of, this, of the same century, the 17th century, another eminent scholar, Faid Kashani, takes us in his commentary of the Quran as Safi, uh, and in his commentary on the covenant verse, even deeper into the world of metaphysics. According to Kashani, this verse refers to God's spreading in front of his knowledge, the essences, haqqaiq, of all generations to come. He then addresses them in languages appropriate to the various degrees of preparedness, isti'idad, of each, of each essence. This should not be understood as speaking, Kashani specifies, but rather as a metaphor expressing this meaning. The entire scenario, according to him, took place in a non-tangible cognitive existence in which the dar, being then an image of light in God's mind, could hear God's question, Allah to be rabbikum, am I not your Lord, due to the cognitive abilities God bestowed upon them. 
Accordingly, the dar replied in languages appropriate to this phase. Towards the end of the discussion, Kashani concludes that the possibility that they spoke in the language of Malakut, the, lang the language of Alam al-Mithal, Mundus Imaginalis, which is different than the world of the intellect, could not be ruled out. We can clearly see here the traces of theosophical theories that locate an intermediate world, an imaginal one, sometimes also called Barzakh, between the tangible world, tangible world and the world of pure intellect. A similar message is conveyed by Kashani in his voluminous hadith compilation, Al-Wafi. Kashani further articulates his views on the subject, not only in reference to the covenant verse, in another work of more philosophical character, titled Al-Kalimat Al-Maknuna. There, inter alia, he draws a distinction between the prehistory of the souls of the prophets and the imams, and uh, between the history of the souls of the rest of mankind. It, if with regard to the former, he, he adheres to a certain variation of the Platonist notion of the soul's pre-existence. In the case of the latter, uh, that is peop ordinary people who are not imams or prophets, he resorts to the Aristotelian view according to which the souls come into being simultaneously with the bodies. This distinction, I would argue, is the result of his attempt to reconcile rationalism with the undeniable mythic depictions of the prophet and the imams in the hadith. I hope I was able to cast some light on the importance of what I see alongside this world, a dunya, and the hereafter, al-akhira, as a third fundamental dimension of Shi'i thought, pre-existence. And I would like to conclude this lecture on a personal note. Pre-existence in Shi'i thought was among the many topics that I used to discuss on a regular basis with Yanis Eschutz, a dear friend of mine and an exceptionally gifted scholar. Yanis, who was a research associate at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London and professor at the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Latvia, passed away unexpectedly roughly a year ago. It was June 21. This was very shortly after he went through the last proofs of his book, Patterns of Thought in Safavid Iran, The Philosophical School of Isfahan and the Gnostic of Shiraz. The book by I.B. Tauris and the Institute of Ismaili Studies was launched in London last month. Of relevance to today's lecture is Yanis's elaboration, mainly in the chapter devoted to the life, uh, works, and philosophical doctrine of Mir Damad on the concept of time in general and on the relation of the world of time and becoming to the world of eternity in particular. In many ways, this lecture is dedicated, dedicated to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Roy. <coughs> Questions, please. Yeah, thank, thank you. That, that was a very impressive. Um, survey. I just uh, unsurprisingly wanted to maybe add a remark pertaining to the Quran. I really appreciated your sort of careful reading of the Quranic account of the Ahd al which I, I think, I mean, is often lazily and incorrectly read as a primordial covenant. I think you made it very clear that actually that doesn't really emerge from it if you take it at face value. Your suggestion was that it's a sort of a moving forwards of um, of a myth of pre-existence. Um, there's an interesting article by Dirk Hartwig in German where he draws attention to, it was actually kind of obvious, but I missed that uh, for years. So the verse comes directly after another verse that describes the Mosaic covenant mm -hmm. um, where the Israelites are sort of covenanted. And, yeah, and so, so I think one might, based on that, maybe suggest that what's happening is, is less, less a moving forward of, um, of, of the idea of pre-existence, but maybe a moving backwards of the Mosaic covenant. Um, so that the Quran can then argue that actually all of humanity, not just the Israelites, are sort of ha have b basically willingly assented to, mm. to God's lordship and can therefore be held accountable. I, I think it's a, it's a plausible idea emerging from the literary context. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, are you referring to uh, Garmlich's uh, article, yeah? You were referring to... Oh, uh, Dirk Hartwig is, is oh. the name. Um, he, okay. Yeah, he's a young scholar who... I, I, okay, no, I thought you mentioned um, another... Uh, Thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to get the reference. Uh, thank you. Um, 
the idea of pre-existence is uh, way above my head. Um, but you presented it in a very clear and, and very oh, interesting way for someone who uh, doesn't think about these things uh, on a regular basis. I, I want to take you back to the question, to the issue that you began with, which is the terminology. Just uh, yeah. um, and you acknowledge that uh, you know the, your use of the word myth uh, has some shortcomings. And sometimes you say the myth of pre-existence, sometimes you say the concept of pre-existence. The notion of... You know, the notion. So uh, you don't use the word etiology, um, which is the you know, explanation for how things come to be the way they are. You might want to use it, but it seems to me that you might want to restrict the word myth to stories like uh, Adam's loins. That's a myth. That's a story. And the function of the story is etiological, or, or, and, mm. and that pre-existence is a concept or an idea. Mm. Uh, just, I, so I would encourage you to seek further clarity on yeah, the language you use to discuss. I have to admit that uh, I've been struggling with uh, this term myth for several years now. And uh, as I suggested at the beginning of this talk, uh, to adhere to a very simple uh, definition of the term, but nevertheless, you're right. Whenever you uh, bring up the term myth, it raises many questions what exactly myth is and uh, does this term could be applied to pre-existence, could it not be applied? But I, I, I am also trying to, you know, um, uh, to, uh, uh, how do you say, to, to provoke a bit uh, scholars in the field who are uh, uh, more reluctant to use uh, this term and I think that this causes a bit of, uh, um, you know, when you use the term, it makes you think a little bit out of the uh, ordinary uh, channels of uh, thought that we are used to. I, I, this is my hope, at least. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, the story of uh, Adam and Eve yeah. is a myth. Yeah. And it has a function, which is to explain where we all came from. Where we yeah. came from. So, um, uh, you can continue to use the word myth, but I, I, would, I would suggest Leave, use it only with respect to these stories and use other terms to refer to. Yeah, but there is a kernel of, of the story to, to, to the idea of, pre uh, let's say, a narrative around which the idea of pre-existence, uh, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. would you not uh, define this kernel as a mythic story? or? Uh? Well, but pre-existence is, is an idea that okay. we may or may not I see, now I see, with, I'm getting what... Uh, but it, there's nothing mythic about it. Yes. Um, All right, this is a, now I got it, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You hear me? Thank you very much, Roy, for this uh, fascinating presentation. I have a few observations and some questions. First of all, I want to praise you on this talk and on a number of other talks that you have done over the past years in so which, in which, <laughs> in which uh, uh, what, what can observe that you are not necessarily seeking for a new topic to, to explore. You go to well studies and well established doctrines or concepts and you re-examine them and you shed new light and original light on them. So this is one of these cases, and I, I noticed this in, in a number of your articles before. Um, now I have uh, another thing. Um, speaking about pre-existent, I think it is implicitly said in your, in, your, in your paper that I read, but I think one should distinguish between pre I, I try to, to do it myself but I think it should be uh, taken into account that, uh, between pre-existent and the myth and prehistory. And uh, when you look at the, um, at the text, the chi text, when they speak about antiquity, so it is the, one can distinguish in, in cases in which they speak about events that he happened, as you say in your article, before the creation of the world. And this is what I would call pre-existence, but there is also a, a strong, a tendency in Shi sources to speak about about the Shia and Shi concepts existing before the historical <coughs> time of the Shia, mm -hmm. and this is another notion which they are interconnected, but it's very important. And in this case, I would I would invite you to 
broaden the scope because what you what you describe as imamishi is present in, in other uh, groups of the Shia as well. I agree. Including Hulat. You can find it in Druze religion, in Nusara religion, in, I think, in Ismailism. So uh, the scope can be broadened. Uh, so this is one point. Another thing is, uh, I always, I've been thinking for years about the concept of time in Shiism. Concept of time. Uh, and I think when you, you speak about pre-existence, one should connect it to eschatological. To, to the eschatological, eschatological time, because in Shiism, my feeling is, as a reader of Shi'i sources, that Shi'is are never, they are never satisfied with the present. So they always go either to the <coughs> pre-existence time or the eschatological time in which things will be to their satisfaction. I agree. So I think, I think one should try to connect this one what, to, to the concept of time in Shiism. Uh, another thing is uh, how much aware, how, how much she is himself were aware to these concepts. This is something that should be explored because one thing that bothers me, why we don't have in she a term for this concept. We have terms for any concept, any other concept. We have Isma, Shafa'a, Walaya, Mahabba, Mawadda. Yeah. Anything, you have a term for it, for any doctrine that was developed. But this very fundamental, I agree with you, it's fundamental. We don't have a term for this. Sometimes you find the word kida. Hmm. Uh, so I'm asking how much aware were she to this uh, concept doctrine? And last point, or two last points. Uh, the theology of Aristotle, you, you mentioned that it has a great influence on Muslim in medieval times, but it, it has an influence throughout all religions. Yes. And for example, you cannot understand the theology of the attributes in Maimonides' Guide of the Perplex without of the theology of Aristotle. It is, yes. all, all his negative theology is based on this. And my just one point about the 2000s here before the creation of the world. There's the number 2000s is a, is a topos. It, it appears. You yes. know? We have in the Midrash, Alpaim Shana Kodem Briat Aolam, Akadosh Baruch Hu Mechazer Acharat Torah, or something like that. So the Torah was also 2000 specifically, not 2002, but 2000 exactly. <laughs> yeah. So this number is a, of is a topos. Yes. This are my, these are my Thank remarks you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, re with regard to uh, how uh, far or to what extent uh, she is were aware of this concept, uh, it is really difficult uh, to say, but I think that uh, uh, in the course of time, the, uh, this idea does uh, receive like specific uh, designation as Alam uh, al Alam al Alam al Adilla, Alam al. Uh, and, and I think it, uh, we, we, maybe there is not a one specific term to describe it, but there are recurring uh, uh, appellations to this uh, ph phenomenon, to this uh, era. Um, that, and uh, my uh, examination of the sources uh, shows that uh, it is dealt with at, at length, very uh, intensively. They are pre preoccupied with the questions Rev, uh, revolving around this um, covenant, this uh, time, and with regard to the perception of time in Shiza, I also agree that this is strongly related to the eschatology from, for various reasons. Also, the, the simple fact that we do not really know uh, what were the physical uh, rules in this uh, realm. What was what, what was there was there at all time as the time we are we are aware of in this world, and the same questions uh, are relevant for the hereafter. So these are like domains in which uh, our uh, terrestrial rules do not really apply, and uh, it raises uh, various questions. Um, so. Have you thought about uh, what, to what, what need it come to respond? 
this idea of pre-existence? Why was there a need for this idea? I, I, this is what I tried to describe in the opening of my lecture. This, the need to uh, provide explanations for our experience here we, is something that goes back. Uh, so uh, in the case of uh, the Shia, of course, uh, you know you read my uh, thesis. Uh, so. I'm asking why you, you are not connecting to the notion of election. Of, of course, the, yes, of because uh, I was wanting to uh, uh, concentrate in this lecture on the implications in, uh, with regard to the problematics that we, we know okay. that uh, it has a, a far-reaching uh, consequences with regard to one's fate in this world, in the year after, whether you will be belonging to the uh, elect, elect group or uh, to the damned group. Uh, but these things are, for me, um, uh, the, the things I discussed today are less familiar, and I'm trying to uh, explore them as far as possible. Uh, so. so yeah, just a quick question. First, I enjoyed your paper a lot. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the notion or, or the story that um, the souls knew each other, the <laughs> Arafu, yes. um, in, in that state, right, of pre-existence. And I wonder when is it first attested, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, the question of... The, the notion of the Arafu. Yes, yes, it's in uh, the traditions ascribed to the Imams. I can tell you, uh, without now going back to my uh, sources, that it was probably the sixth or the fifth Imams. Whether whether it was really said by the sixth or the fifth Imam, who knows? But it is to be found in uh, compilations of Hadith that were uh, uh, written in the ninth century. Of course. I found I found the expression Ta'aruf al arwah in a story by Tanukhi, who yeah. was not a Shia, I think, 10th yeah, century. But this is the Abbasid period. Yes. This is Abbasid period. So, you yes. know, there is the translation uh, movement, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. many ideas are in the air, and it's not surprising. But to say that it, the idea was introduced into Shiism due to the translation movement is a bit uh, problematic because there is no, only... I, I don't think it has anything yeah. to do with the translation movement. I, I'll show you the story. Uh, uh, okay, it's thank a, you. an interesting one. Okay, there, thank there, you. There's a famous Sunni version, uh, uh, Please. Okay, um, so... Uh, yeah, this, this, I will teach this paper, uh, include this paper into my teaching. It was, it was, a, oh. uh, it was magnificent. Uh, now, um, yeah, so, so the pre, yeah, the pre, what to do with souls if you think in, in schemes? Uh, so either there, there is a universal soul and the one and we emanate from them. And then, then if we follow the philosophers, then we go back to, to him, and then there will be no individual souls anymore. Yes. Uh, so that's a logical solution. Uh, or either, or, or um, every, um, we emanate, and then we remain as individual souls. That, that has no logic to it, but that's the, the normal, <laughs> normal vision. Or, or you can, if you want another logical solution, okay, then all souls pre-exist, and then we will exist forever. That's also a logical one. Yes. This doesn't seem to me the interestingly what is predominant is an is an illogical uh, solution mm -hmm. for for what happens uh, with souls. That's one. Uh, the other the other uh, is uh, well is Manichaeism and Gnosticism, yes. which um, so so if there are there are two principles, good and evil, uh, light and darkness, uh, spir spirit and matter. That's, that's uh, the radical, radical dualism. Uh, Islam can be viewed as the most radical monotheism, denying the most of the existence of, of evil. Now, this view that, that uh, the, the light is trapped in, particles of light are yes. trapped in the matter, that's, that's uh, a, a core of Manichaeism. Mm -hmm. Now, Manichaeism is such a... Um, um, pessimist religion, and it's such an so it's 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 uh, it's the religion of an oppressed elite, 
that it was so successful that it, uh, that it was uh, wiped out and exterminated mm. by all other religions uh, as the only world religion which was all really exterminated. Now, now <coughs> but it survives. Every, every, well, in a lot of, in Islam it survives in Shiism, it survives in Sufism, in uh, wherever you, wherever someone is unsatisfied with, with the establishment and, with the, and think themselves higher, Mm -hmm. Trapped in the in the, the the matter, trapped in the masses, trapped in the ama, in the darkness, but being superior and oppressed and eventually hopefully victorious, then there is there yeah. are, there is these particles of manichaeism yes. uh, remaining. Well, I can only thank you uh, for bringing up, uh, especially manichaeism, uh, which I know. Uh, uh, many of uh, the themes that we meet in Manichaean uh, or what we know about Manichae Manichaeism are, have parallels in uh, Shiism. Uh, this, this too, of course, yes. Mm. Uh, I, I'm going to add a, a weird marginal addition to your Quran list. And I was wondering if you've ever encountered anything like this. So, the weird, the weird one is as a pre-existent ruh that might sort of be in the Quran is Jesus. Hmm. So, there's a really early tafsir of uh, Miriam where the ruh sent to Miriam to announce the birth is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Is Jesus in his kind of pre-existent Oh, form. really? And so, and usually that interpretation is attached to a version of the covenant story attributed to a babe and cop. It mostly appears in, in Hanbali sources that you think of, but... Uh, yeah, but this does not add a uh, Quranic reference, a reference to the uh, concept. It does. So, because in the, in the in sort of Miriam, it doesn't call, it's not called Gabriel. It's called the Ruh, right? It says, if we sent our Ruh, Right, um, and then Jesus, of course, is called Aroch elsewhere in the Quran as well. Um, now, this, there's no by no means is unambiguous, yeah, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. But and I have not found it's not a very popular interpretation. The last person I found that uh, um, endorses it is Abu Muslim bin Sahani, and but we don't have his tafsir. He's a Mu'tazili professor, and it does appear in. Um, Shiite tafsir because mm. they kind of pick up that strand. Um, that, that kind of reminds me of the the because you talked about the, the different covenants. Uh, you also had like the general mitah and then the mitah aris that is separate for the for the prophets. Themselves. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. you. You said Abu Muslim al Mu'tazili. So yeah, Abu Muslim al Sahani is his name. I think you probably find you could find it quoted in Jishumi and Tabarsi who like mm. plagiarized him. Um, and the Babe and Cop covenant story you can find in a bunch of books. Thank you very much. Um. Uh, uh, just a point of interest, uh, this paper is about uh, pre-existence in Shi Imami Shi'i thought. Will you deal with pre-existence in Sunni thought as well and do something comparative? Or uh, is there if, if it turns into a larger project, then definitely, yes. Okay. But uh, as I said, I'm just at the beginning of mapping this. Uh, uh, I mean, because Ori Rubin has written a lot about Yes, the, yes. And this is, as I said, related also to the concept of fitra. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me start with Imam <laughs> and then uh, see uh, how it develops. Good. Thank you. So, uh, since Sean uh, mentioned uh, Hanbalism and David said, uh, would you do something uh, in Sunnism, I would like to recommend Kitab al ruh by Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah mm. I think that you will find that he, he knew a lot of uh, Shia sources and perhaps uh, you'll, you. be, you'll be surprised from the depth of uh, his analysis. Yeah, I discovered how uh, deep the analysis uh, of the Shia by Ibn Taymiyyah was a few years ago. So, uh, 
But Kitab al-Ruh is really systematic, and uh, as far as uh, Duncan MacDonald uh, wrote, and I think in 1939, it's the, the most comprehensive uh, treatise uh, okay. on, uh, on the spirit in, uh, in Islamic thought. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.